Good morning and thanks for joining us today online at Colonial Presbyterian Church for our worship service. I'm Pastor Todd Weiland and I'm the campus pastor at our Overland Park site and I'm so glad that each and every one of you are with us today. I just want to first of all remind us that today is a special day. It is Communion Sunday so hopefully you've had a moment to gather the elements and you're prepared for that a little later in this service. I've got a couple announcements I'd like to share with you. First of all in terms of giving. If you're worshiping online, a great way to give of your tithes and offerings is to give online at colonialkc.org give. It's really intuitive to go through the steps there online. So do find that link and please continue to give of your tithes and your resources to the Lord. I've got a couple announcements I'd like to share with you. The first one is very devastating with what's happening over in the Ukraine. And we're going to pray about that a little later in the service. But we have here at Colonial opened up a Ukrainian crisis offering. I'd love for you to perfectly consider giving toward that. Um, it's currently available on our online giving resources. Um, it's just such a really important thing for each of us to perfectly consider how is it, God, that you want me to help in this situation? And prayer is big, and giving to it as well is big. These people over there in Ukraine really need our support, and they need our prayers. So hopefully you'll perfectly consider giving to that. Uh, Ukrainian crisis offering. On a lighter note, we have trivia night coming up and it's going to be happening um, at the Overland Park site on March 25th. So get your team of eight registered for trivia night 2022 and join Colonial Missions at either event on March 25th at our Overland Park location or on April 8th at our South Kansas City location. All proceeds will go towards student ministry mission trips for this summer. So hopefully you will engage in that. Now I'd just like to take a moment and pray before we sing our worship songs to the Lord. Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord God, we come to you today with hopeful hearts. We look forward to worshiping you, God. Open our hearts, open our minds to your word. Open our hearts and our minds to your Holy Spirit. God, we need to hear from you. And then send us from this worship service out in there to the world, God prepared us, ready to serve you, God. Help us to worship you now, God. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Now I'd love for you to join your voices with our worship team, and let's worship God together in song. Good morning, Colonial family. It's a great day to be worshiping together as one church, so let's lift our voices wherever you are and praise God.
Oh God, you are greater, you are higher, you are stronger than any other force, than any other God. And God, you are faithful to us. You are so good to us. We can't help but sing your praises today. We can't help but sing out praises to our God. We sing of your greatness. We sing of your power. And we sing of your goodness. All our life, you've been there for us, God. And we thank you. We worship you today. It is good to sing praises to God, isn't it? Yes, it is. Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord God, we come to you today 
And Lord, we just thank you for being our God, for saving us, providing us with salvation because of what Christ did for us on the cross and then resurrected from the dead, paying the price for our sins. God, we thank you for that. And today, as we prepare a little later in the service to take communion, we're reminded of his sacrifice for us. God, thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice for each one of us, for the salvation we have through him and him alone, God. God, today our hearts are heavy as we continue to think of those people involved out there in Ukraine and Russia in this conflict, Lord. We pray for peace in that region. And Lord, we pray for wisdom to descend upon the leaders as they work toward a peaceful solution. Lord, we pray for your protection to be upon the people in that region. Some of them are in the middle of the situation where others are far from the action, but sanctions have closed movement of funds and ongoing ministry and resources in the area. God, we pray for your protection and for your provision for all those involved. And Lord, we pray for the ministries located in the neighboring countries bordering the Ukraine who are taken in thousands of refugees. And Lord, we recently heard 120,000 Ukrainians have fled from other countries, including Poland, Germany, Hungary, Romania, and many others. And we expect the number to continue to swell. God, give them places to go. Have people open their homes, countries to welcome them during this time of crisis. Lord, we pray for all our Ukrainian brothers and sisters in Christ, that they'll stand strong in their faith as the light of Christ amidst this very challenging time. And Lord, today we want to lift up to you Natalia Bolka, who serves with crew in Budapest, Hungary, where she oversees strategic planning and ministry operations for over 50 Eastern European countries, which includes her homeland of Ukraine. Lord, pray for Natalia as her heart is broken by all the events of these last two weeks in Ukraine. Lord, just bless her and give her wisdom as she leads her team through this crisis. And now, God, we come to you and silently confess our sins to you. Hear us, God, as we come to you. God, you forgive sins and no one else can do that. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And hear us now as we pray out loud together the prayer that you taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. Pastor Jim West here. It is my joy to be with you this morning, and I'm glad that you were able to join us. I, I know it's a crazy time, and uh, you know a lot of tough things going on around the world, and particularly, obviously, the, the war in Ukraine. And I'm very grateful that our elders have decided to extend a special offering, and you can go to our website and just click on the drop-down menu for Give, and give to that, uh, that special offering is as God leads you. But let's continue to pray constantly, vigilantly, every day for peace in our world and particularly peace in Ukraine that uh, God would move his hand and bring it into this war. Amen. All right. Well, as uh, we come to this time in our worship service where we open up the word of God, many of you know that we have been slowly making our way through the whole gospel of John. We're now in the 19th chapter and the trial of Jesus is over. Pilate has been blackmailed into condemning an innocent man to death on a cross. And so as Jesus is being led away, we're going to pick up the story there in John 19, verses 16 through 22. Here's the reading of God's word. So Pontius Pilate delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him 
and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we gather today, uh, here in Kansas City and all over the world where, where the believers are gathered together, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we see here the harsh reality of what it took to save sinful souls, that the Son of God humbled himself and took on human flesh and, and, and entered into human history as the Lamb of God, the unblemished Lamb to take away the sins of the world. And as we painfully walk with Jesus through the crucifixion, I pray that you would give us the courage to look, to, to, to gaze upon him in this horribly painful, difficult experience of, of crucifixion. Because it is here that we see our Lord, our King, on his throne. And his throne is a cross. And it is from that throne that he will rescue the world. We thank you, we love you, we praise you. Speak to us now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, um, my message today, which is not an easy message, obviously, you can see the text that we're dealing with, but uh, it's just called the cross and the sign. And uh, it will fall under three subheadings. Number one, the crucifixion. Number two, Jesus in the middle. And number three, the first gospel. <laughs> okay, so... Let's begin with the crucifixion. You know, let's, let's just acknowledge where we are. We're on the first Sunday in March, the year 2022, and we gather under the dark cloud of war. Over the past two weeks, we've seen pictures, videos, and news stories of Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Hundreds have been slaughtered, thousands more injured as the great war machine of Vladimir Putin wreaks havoc upon a smaller and less fortified nation. And yet life goes on in the United States. March madness is about to begin. Opening day for the royals is right around the corner, and soon many of us will be heading out to enjoy ourselves on spring break. The irony of our comfort, in contrast to the horrors of war in Ukraine, creates a tension that we all feel, and yet we have little power to affect change. I mean, that, that's how we feel, right? And so what do we do? Well, most often we just turn away. It's more than we can stand to, to, to watch, to look at, and so we just turn away. We try to minimize the horror of it all. We, we speak of the war with a casual tone that quickly spins into political criticism and financial projections. We talk about oil and sanctions and the European Union. Yet all the while, every day, Ukrainian civilians are dying. They are being targeted by a deranged leader who would do the very same thing to our nation if not for the convenient ocean protecting us from his reach. You know, the casualness by which we end up talking about this war is quite similar to the casualness by which we often speak of our Lord's crucifixion. I mean, we can intellectually acknowledge that crucifixion was a horrible form of torture and execution. We can intellectually acknowledge that, that Jesus was innocent. We can intellectually acknowledge that something profound happened on that cross that somehow made it possible for us to be forgiven and rescued from our own destruction. But when we actually look at the cross, it's really kind of too horrible for us to look at, and so we turn away. We don't want to look at it. We don't want to feel it. I mean, after all, what, what can we possibly do about that horrible crucifixion? Life goes on, right? So we, we look away. We indulge in our pleasures and our everyday lives with little thought 
to the horrific suffering that purchased our freedom. Church, don't look away. Not today. Don't look away from the pain of this world, not even the war at Ukraine. We can all do our part, and that begins today as we launch our offering, as we begin to make room in our city for refugee families, both from Afghanistan and Ukraine. There's something we can do. We can pray, we can give, we can be generous, we can show hospitality, we can intercede. We don't look away. And even more importantly, we don't look away from the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, our hope is in what Jesus suffered on our behalf. But we must look now, right now, at that innocent man crowned with thorns, beaten and bloodied, accused and condemned, though he has committed no crime. We must look with full attention as he is now being led away to be crucified. He is led as a lamb to the slaughter, just as Isaiah predicted in Isaiah 53, 7. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, is the lamb of God, and he has come to take away the sins of the world, but at a horrific price. As Jesus is led away from Pontius Pilate, we need to know, and we know this from the other gospel accounts, that he must first endure the horrific vibratio, which is the fear, uh, fiercest form of flogging inflicted upon those who are about to be crucified by the Roman government. Jesus will be led to a pole that is planted firmly in the ground. His back will be bared. He'll be knocked to his knees. His bound hands will be placed over the pole, around the pole, and then multiple Roman soldiers will begin to scourge his back with a leather whip embedded with bits of metal, glass, and bone. His skin will literally be filleted right off his back. Witnesses of this kind of scourging in the ancient world would say that sometimes you could see the person's entrails or their ribs, their spine. It is a pain of such unthinkable horror that men sometimes died just from the verberatio before they even made it to the cross. Of course, those soldiers who, who killed the man by, by whipping him would have been soundly uh, disciplined because the whole point of crucifixion was that the man would die a slow, public, excruciating, and humiliating death, one that would linger on perhaps three or four days before he expired. It was a punishment, crucifixion was, a punishment reserved for non-Romans. It was a punishment used almost exclusively for slaves and the worst kind of criminals in the occupied areas, in particular insurrectionists. You know, crucifixion was actually never practiced in Rome itself. It was only in the occupied provinces. It served as an example for any of those who would even think about insurrection against the empire? Well, after the prisoner was scourged, the Romans would force that condemned man to carry the horizontal beam of his own cross through the streets of the city. This was their practice. They would make this condemned man who had been scourged carry this beam. The beam weighed about 100 pounds, and they would take the longest route that they could throughout the city as to make sure that, that this was a clear example to the occupied people of what happens when you mess with Rome. Some scholars uh, believe that, he, that they actually walked him all the way through the town to see if anybody wanted to make a case for that condemned man, and they might even reconsider opening uh, the case and, and, and have a new hearing if somebody would speak for his innocence. Now, John remembers in our text that Jesus bore his own cross. He said, bearing his own cross, John 19, 17. So, you know, many of you will say, well, I remember the synoptic accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that speak very clearly about a man named Simon of Cyrene who was seized by the Roman guard and, and forced to carry the cross of Jesus. And I, there's not a conflict here. John is familiar with those accounts, but what he's trying to make us understand is that Jesus bore his own cross. 
um, till he couldn't, right? It was a long walk around the city. Jesus had actually been scourged twice. Remember, he had the, the, the former uh, form of, of scourging where he was beaten with clubs. Um, that happened before his final conviction when um, Pilate was just trying to throw the dog a bone and have him punished and then release him. So he's been scourged twice, and this time by the verb ratio, which is so much worse. He did carry his own cross for a time until his weakened body, probably due to the loss of blood, led to the point where he simply could not bear the hundred pounds of that beam anymore. John reports then that the crucifixion was set to take place not far outside the city in a place known as Golgotha. Uh, it is an Aramaic word meaning place of the skull. Many of you know if you've grown up in in the church and sung songs about Calvary. Well, Calvary is the Latin word for the place of the skull, right? Golgotha is the Greek, or sorry, the, the Aramaic, and Calvary would be the Latin word for place of the skull. Now, we have long imagined that uh, Golgotha was a hill. You know, we've heard that song on a hill far away in the old rugged cross, right? We actually have no biblical reason to assume that Golgotha was a hill. Um, in fact, we actually don't know where Golgotha was. Uh, you'll look at some maps of ancient Jerusalem, and they, they put Golgotha just to the west, northwest of the temple, but still within the city limits. But here in John's gospel, we understand it's outside of the city. It's near the city, but it's not actually within the city. And that was part of the Jewish faith. I mean, it's just completely inappropriate to crucify somebody inside of the holy city. So we believe that Golgotha was likely just outside the city, um, and, but close to the city, because we, we learn in the text that many Jews read the sign that Pilate had posted above Jesus on the cross, and so it clearly was close to the city. Now, the actual act of crucifying a man was predictable, and incredibly brutal. When Jesus finally arrived at Golgotha, uh, he was very weakened, obviously, from the verberatio, uh, but they uh, would have stripped him bare of his clothes. That's part of the humiliation of crucifixion is that you're up there nude without any clothing. Um, they would secure his crossbeam to the vertical beam. The vertical beam would have been laying on the ground. They would have put the crossbeam and nailed it in. And then they would have laid Jesus down uh, on the cross. They would have slightly bent his legs and then driven a nine-inch nail between the tendon and the ankle on both feet. They would have also put a small piece of wood, a little platform on that vertical beam right beneath his feet so that later he'll be able to press down on that piece of wood. And I'll explain why in just a minute. Of course, then uh, his arms would be stretched out on the horizontal beams, and they would have taken those long nails and driven them uh, through his wrists or forearms here, not directly through the hands because the hands would have pulled through, but probably, you know, about here on both sides. And then they would have also tied ropes around his hands just so there was no chance of uh, the arms pulling through those nails. Once he was uh, firmly secured to uh, the cross, they would lift him up and drop that cross into a hole. Now I just want to remind you that all of this is the fulfillment of Scripture. Uh, Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53, 5, that the Messiah would be pierced for our transgressions. And the great messianic lament, uh, lament that we find in Psalm 22, and I'll speak more about this in our Good Friday service, our Tenebrae service coming up here in just a few weeks. Uh, we read in verse 16, A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Now, you have to know something, you know, again, I'll touch on this later, but crucifixion uh, was a rather recent invention of torture. It, it didn't start with the Romans, it started with the Chaldeans, but uh, it was just a couple hundred years before Christ that, that we learn of the first crucifixion. 
Whereas Isaiah and Psalm 22, I mean, th these are so many, especially Psalm 22. I mean, that's a thousand years before Christ. And yet here we have in two different places, the prediction that the anointed one of God is pierced. Uh, and specifically, they have pierced my hands and feet. Uh, this absolutely sounds like crucifixion. In the context of Jewish execution, that was always stoning. People were stoned to death. They weren't pierced. There was no piercing hands and feet in the Jewish world of, of execution. And so this is, a, this is prophetic. And right now, these prophecies of the Messiah's suffering are being fulfilled. Again, Jesus is now um, secured to the cross. They, they drop the cross into this hole, and now he's hanging on the cross. Uh, now, what would happen is that immediately the weight of his body would pull down on his arms. His body would be shrinking down, and immediately that causes tremendous pressure upon the chest. The chest kind of collapses, and breathing becomes extremely difficult. And so inevitably, uh, Jesus, as every other crucified person, would try to push up. And of course, you know, pushing on a nail driven between your feet, but there's just enough support by that little piece of wood that they put there that you can try to push yourself up to, so that you can breathe. And the, the pain of pushing up would be so excruciating on both the arms and, and the, the, the feet and legs that were nailed to the cross, just an unthinkable amount of pain but it was necessary in order for the man to be able to expand his chest and fill his lungs with air. At the point when the man could no longer push himself up and breathe, he would die of asphyxiation, just a lack of, of oxygen to the heart. It's a horrible way to die. Um, you need to know that this form of torture was designed to create the maximum amount of pain, but also the maximum amount of humiliation. While that man was nailed to a cross, and he might survive, he might be a very strong man who continued to push himself up for three to four days. Uh, you can't protect your face, right, from the insects. You can't protect your face from the birds plucking at your eyes. Uh, you can't protect your naked body from the sun or the cold and the rain the dark of night, um, it, it was a, a horrible, horrible reality to be crucified. It wasn't just a form of capital punishment. It was a slow and public torture designed to send a message. <laughs> uh, you, you had that to look forward to if you revolted against Rome. In fact, the Roman historian Cicero described crucifixion as the most cruel and horrifying death. And indeed it was. Now what we notice here in John's Gospel is that he does not give us any details about the crucifixion at all. And in fact, you can go back and read all four Gospel accounts. No details about the crucifixion whatsoever. I mean, uh, why? Well, because the Jews were all too familiar with these details. They, they knew exactly what a crucifixion looked like, what it entailed, what the Roman soldiers did. They had seen it hundreds of times. And so John just simply writes, there they were crucified. There he was crucified. He and the two others, right? You know, John was there. He, he witnessed every painful lash, every swing of the soldier's hammer. He heard our Lord cry out. He watched him die. John never turned away. But like most people who suffer trauma, he has no interest in rehashing the details of his friend's suffering. This is exactly why men who have been in war and combat, they don't want to talk about it. You can't make them talk about it because they're going to have to relive it all over again. And that's really what we see in all four gospel accounts. There's no need to talk about those details. It's too painful. And all we get is there they crucified him. Now, as we look at that cross, we don't turn away. It's painful. 
It's horrible. It's unthinkable. It's, it's a horror beyond description. It hurts us just to think about it and to look at it. But let me tell you something. As bad as the crucifixion was, it was not the worst of our Lord's suffering. We'll see that later. Let me now look to my, uh, turn to my second subheading, Jesus in the Middle. Uh, you know, all four Gospels agree that Jesus was not the only Jew to be crucified on this Passover day. Two other men were crucified with Jesus, one on his left and one on his right. John reports in verse 18, there they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Now I know, and many of you know, that Luke's gospel gives quite an interesting account and, and very specific dialogue that happens between the two thieves and then even between Jesus and, and one of the, the men. And, and we'll look at that maybe here in just a minute. But really, today I want us to focus on John's description of the three crosses because the way he describes it is significant. John's point, the way he describes it, is that there, there are criminals, there are other men being crucified on either side of Jesus, and he is in the middle. He's in the midst of the condemned men. So let me just make a few observations about that picture that John provides for us. You know, first of all, it's quite likely. I mean, I, I just want you to use your imagination, fill in the blanks here. I think this is reasonable. I think it's quite likely that there were, there were crucifixions already scheduled for this day. It makes sense, right? It, it's, it's the highest attendance day in all of Jerusalem's year because all these pilgrims are there for the Passover. It's the day of the Passover. The streets are packed. The city is packed. If you want to make an example of, out of insurrectionists, in a season where insurrection would be most likely to happen, which is Passover, when all these people here, the Roman guards, completely outnumbered, what do you do? You host a good old hanging, right? In the old, you know, the old West, they would have a hanging and all the crowd would come out to see it, watch the, the Westerns, you watch that, it's horrible. Well, in, in the ancient Roman world, you just host a good old crucifixion party, right? You, you'd have a couple crosses out there, you go ahead, choose that day to have some crucifixions. It sends a very clear message to this packed city of people occupied by the Romans. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about an insurrection, right? So these three, these three men, there were three men that were scheduled to be crucified on this day. And you read the context, and it seems pretty clear that one of those men was this Famous insurrectionist named Barabbas. He was scheduled to be crucified on this day along with those other two men. And then if you just come along this line of thinking, it makes a lot of sense. It really makes a lot of sense why all the Gospels talk about the exchange between Barabbas and Jesus. Right? Because when Pilate offers to release a criminal to them, he's offering one of these three guys, the worst of them, maybe, uh, back to the people, or Jesus, the king of the Jews, and they choose Barabbas, which does what? It leaves a cross empty. It also accounts for why the crowd so quickly said, crucify him, right? Because there's an empty cross. Put Jesus on that cross. It's an exchange. Take Barabbas off the cross, put Jesus in his place. So with that in mind, we must now imagine the picture of Jesus occupying the center cross from the perspective of Barabbas. Can you feel that? Can you imagine the thoughts running through the mind of Barabbas, who has now been freed? He's out there in the crowd, and he's looking at these three crosses, and he sees Jesus on his cross. The cross that had Barabbas' name on it. A cross he deserved for what he had done. <laughs> it brings whole new meaning to the familiar phrase, there but by the grace of God go I. Because it was exactly 
because of the grace of God that Jesus took the place of Barabbas and every other convicted sinner sentenced to a horrible fate. Listen, if you're looking to find your place in this story, start by taking the place of Barabbas and acknowledge to yourself that cross had my name on it. He died in my place. Start there. Now, as we gaze upon Jesus in the middle, we also must immediately call to mind Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant who was what? Who was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. That's the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 12. And here we see Jesus in the middle of the transgressors. He is counted as one of them. And here we know that he bears the sin of many, the sins of the world. He bears your sin. He bears my sin. He bears the sin of every person who's ever sinned against us and every person we've ever sinned against. Though he has committed no crime, right? So it's because Jesus bears our sin as an innocent man who dies in our place as the Lamb of God that he is in a position to intercede for us, all of us, because we're guilty, he's not. He's taking our punishment. He's dying in our place. That intercession is so beautifully captured in Luke 23, verse 34, when Jesus pleads with the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Only Jesus could say that because he's in the midst of us. He's taken our place. He's been numbered as one of us. He bears the sin of all of us, and he is now interceding for guilty people, asking the Father to forgive them, to forgive you, to forgive me. You know, the writer of Hebrews pictures Jesus in the middle as our high priest. I know you don't like that word because, you know, we've seen horrible examples of high priests, but you have to remember that the original high priest appointed by God were those who made intercession and, and served as a representative to atone for the sins of the people. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's acting as our high priest, as our representative to atone for the sins of the people. But unlike the high priest of the Jews, who would do that through sacrificing an unblemished animal, Jesus is sacrificing himself. His blood, his perfect blood, is the means by which our lives will be saved, our sins will be forgiven, that we will be atoned for. But look what it took. It took for him to get into the middle, on the cross, in a midst, to be counted amongst us, to be one of us, and to be all of our sins, to be put onto him. He's dying on a cross in our place. He's in the middle. Listen, church, love is demonstrated by the one who is willing to get in the middle of it with us. I have a friend. Uh, I'm not going to mention his name. He's an elder here at Colonial. I've just enjoyed knowing him and watching him from a distance uh, recently, very close up. He's a good man, an honest man, a very busy man, hardworking, like many of us. He, he doesn't have a lot of margin because he works hard, he plays hard, he loves his family. But not long ago, when one of our church members came into a horrible crisis, I watched my friend, an elder of our church, jump into the middle of it, just totally immersed in it. He's given up hundreds of hours to help uh, a family through a horrible situation. And those were hours that he would have otherwise invested in making money or going fishing or spending time with his family. But you see, he gets it. Jesus got into the middle with us to show us his love. And that's what love requires. That's, that's what the love of Jesus compels us to do. Get in the middle. Get entangled in it. It's costly. It's messy. It's difficult. And sometimes our own dying to self is what is required before we ever get to see a resurrection story. But listen, you will never really love another person from the safety of the sidelines. Love gets into the middle. Love lives 
sacrificially. Love takes on the pain and hardship and mess of another and says, I'm not leaving. I'll do whatever it takes. It's exactly what Jesus did. Exactly what he calls us to do when he says, take up your cross and follow me. Amen. I just want you to see him. Can you see him? He's the one in the middle. And he's there because he loves us. No matter the cost. He's not leaving. He's going to see it through. Now, finally, we must also look at Jesus in the middle from the perspective of one of the two thieves on either side of him. The two thieves, remember, are getting what they deserve. They've committed a horrible crime. They are being horribly but justly punished. Their punishment is painful and it's humiliating and ultimately will lead to their death. But by the grace of God, they have been given just enough time to encounter Jesus and to make a decision. They can either see Jesus as an imposter, you know, a, a, a person who claimed to be a savior but couldn't even save himself. Or they can see Jesus as the Messiah of God who came to save us by dying in our place. The innocent one who steps in and says, not him, take me. Now, as we know from the 23rd chapter of Luke, one of those condemned men actually joins the crowd in ridiculing Jesus. They were all saying, hey, you know, you saved others, save yourself. You know, I mean, if you're all that, if you're the Messiah, why don't you just call on the angels and just come on down here and we'll all believe you and bow down and worship you. This is a vile man. He will die a vile man and his fate will be forever sealed amongst the damned. That's how that works. However, the other man comes to his senses. He sees that Jesus is innocent, that he is without sin. He sees that Jesus is actually the king who is soon to enter into his kingdom. He is taken by Jesus. He understands that the kingdom of Jesus is not of this world. And so this condemned man asks. He asks Jesus to remember him. He asks Jesus to look upon him with mercy. He asks if he might one day be welcomed into the heavenly kingdom where Jesus is about to go. And even at that late hour, even given all the horrible crimes that that man had committed, because of who Jesus is and what Jesus is accomplishing on this cross that only Jesus can do, because of the intercession and the atonement that Jesus will accomplish, our Lord and Savior turns and looks to him from the middle and he makes a promise that you will be welcome in my kingdom. Your sins will be forgiven even this day. You'll be with me in paradise. Like, that's mind-blowing. But that's what Jesus came to do. He came to make intercession for those who will ask through your repentance, through your faith in him, that you might be forgiven. Reconcile to God, no matter what you've done. He came to take your punishment upon himself. So if you will ask, and you will repent, and you will humble yourself, he will take away your sin. Let me ask you a question. Who do you relate with in this story? Yeah, I mean, it's really what you do when you read a narrative like this. The Bible invites us to find our place in the narrative. Where are we? You know, are, are we those who are Barabbas? Like we know what we were, we know who we are, we know what we've done, we know what we deserve, and yet we see Jesus on our cross that had our name on it, and we're wrecked by that, and we love him because he took our place. Are you one of the two men on the cross, right? And you're trying to figure out what to make of this guy. Maybe... maybe you know, you know you're kind of suffering right now and you kind of are getting what you deserve, but you can't take your eyes off of Jesus. And, and his invitation to you is just pulling on your heart. Maybe, maybe you're the other guy. And your life is horrible, but you just love to mock Jesus anyways. Like, like you're, you just kind of join the crowd, but here you are kind of getting what you deserve and it's not going to end well for you. I mean, you... 
I'll come back to this, but I really want you to find your place in this story. Let me turn now to my third and final subheading, the first gospel. So all four gospels agree that Pontius Pilate placed a sign above Jesus on the cross. And in John's account, we read in verse 19, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. This is really interesting information. Uh, why would Pilate write this? Why would he have this written on Jesus' cross? Well, if you remember, just, just, just minutes ago, you know, before the verb ratio and now Jesus on the cross, the last thing that happened there uh, Pilate had brought out his judgment seat. He brought Jesus out and he said, shall I crucify your king? Remember this? And the high priest said, we have no king but Caesar, which was a very ironic response. I mean, they're literally saying, we are model Roman citizens and you're a terrible governor if you don't crucify this insurrectionist who's challenging the kingship of Caesar. You know, I mean, Pilate didn't buy that for a minute, but it was a veiled threat that they were they would tattle on Caesar. They would go to Caesar and say, this governor would not squash an insurrectionist. He's a terrible governor. He's feeling very blackmailed, and so he condemns Jesus to die on the cross. But, you know, Pilate could not help but notice the sheer ire and anger, <laughs> just the way... The, the high priest would go berserk every time Pilate referred to Jesus as the king of the Jews. He's picked up on this. He's not an idiot. So what does he do? I mean, he's been blackmailed into crucifying an innocent man, but he's going to have the last word. And he has a sign put up there, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And he has it written in Aramaic and in Greek and in Latin so the whole world can see it. Now, let's just take a minute. Uh, if you've read the other gospel accounts, I know sometimes people get into a picky fight about things, so let's just deal with this, all right? The, the words, the way the words of the sign translate are different in each gospel. So just real quickly, Mark's account reads, the king of the Jews. Luke's account reads, this is the king of Jews. And Matthew's account reads, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So which is it? Well, this is easily solved. Remember, I mean, it was written in three different languages, right? So the actual literal translation dependent upon the language in which it was written accounts for why uh, the translation is different. It's, now, remember Aramaic, this, this is really important. Aramaic was the everyday language of the Jews. Greek was the universal language of trade in the ancient world. And Latin was the language of the Romans and the language of law. And so it would read a little bit different. And each gospel writer probably is just using one of the different translations. Matthew would definitely be using Aramaic. He was very much a, a Hebrew man and a, a Jewish man and writes with that in mind. Luke was a Greek physician, Greek-speaking physician. He's probably quoting the Greek version and, and both Mark and John may very well be just quoting the Latin because they can, I don't know. But it, it accounts for that. Whatever the case, here's what we know, is that that sign really bothered the Jewish high priest. Like, they're beside themselves. In verse 21, we read, So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. I, we really see the true nature of the chief priest. It's so political. It's such a power grab. It's just, you know, remember that at one point earlier in John's gospel, they seem to be, like, legitimately afraid that if people thought Jesus was the Messiah, the king, that, that there would be a revolt against Rome and, and Rome would come in and squash Jerusalem and, and them and their positions and so on. Yet now when Jesus has been nailed to the cross, they're still just very deeply upset that Pilate would even mockingly refer to Jesus as the king of the Jews. They want Jesus presented as a fraud. They want everybody here to think that he's cursed by God because he's nailed to a tree. He claimed to be a king. He's a fraud. He's not the Messiah. They want him completely forgotten forever. But what they could not possibly anticipate was that Pilate would put a sign over him saying, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And when they beg him to take it down, <laughs> Pilate says, nope, 
What I've written, I've written. Church, don't miss this. The first written gospel is the gospel of Pontius Pilate. <laughs> Think about that. The first written gospel is written by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, who writes the words, this is Jesus, the king. And by God's providence, everywhere you will ever look of a picture depicting Jesus on a cross above him is written in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin, this is Jesus, the king. Forever after. And it's no, no small thing that it's written in the three most powerful, influential languages of the ancient world. You know, Hebrew Aramaic was literally the language of God, self-revelation to Israel. The Greek was the language of the arts and commerce, Latin, the language of law and justice. I mean, just think about the ramifications of that. In all three languages, of all the scopes of society, we have written for us the Gospel of Pontius Pilate, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. <laughs> That's just really ironic. The universal proclamation of Jesus' kingdom is unwittingly cemented into time by the least likely person, Pontius Pilate. All right. Now, I just want us to just take a minute and breathe. It's been hard to look at Jesus on the cross, but as we see this sign and we begin to reflect upon the meaning, here's, here's the great irony. You and I both know this is true. Jesus is actually the king. Pontius Pilate may have said it mockingly. He might have said it as a final jab at the high priest, but he wasn't wrong about that. He is the king. He is the most ironic king because his throne is a cross. You know, the throne of every other king is a place of comfort, a place of honor, a place of respect, a place where he looks down at the rest of the world and he rules out of his comfort where he sends his soldiers and all that. He's a luxury crown of gold and so on. But this king, this King Jesus, his crown is a cross. Not his crown, his throne. His throne is a cross. And everywhere we look today, whenever we think of the power of Jesus, where do we see him? We don't see him sitting on a chair. We see him on a cross. That's so true. Everywhere around the world today, the cross is the most recognized symbol of God's love and God's power through his son, Jesus Christ. The most recognized symbol in the world. And it's exactly what Jesus predicted in John 12, 32. He said, and I, when I'm lifted up, will draw all men to myself. And that is exactly what we've seen over the past 2,000 years. People of every tribe, tongue, and nation have come to know and trust this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Why? Because he sits on a powerful throne encrusted with gold and diamonds and jewels? No. No. Because they see the king stripped and beaten and bloodied with a crown of thorns that says, I love you this much. That though I've committed no crime, I will take your place on your cross to save you because I love you. This is the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave us his son, the king, the lamb of God, who died on a cross so that all who would believe in him would not perish but receive eternal life. And this is why we love him. This is why we honor him. This is why we serve him. This is why we commit our whole lives to his glory. Because his throne is a cross. Because he gave up his power, his privilege, and his very life to save ungrateful, sin-sick souls like you and like me. Amen? Thanks be to God. Now, here's the deal. We've looked at him, which means you have to respond. We have to respond to the King of the Jews, our representative, our intercessor, the one who hangs on a cross that has our name on it. You can't you look away. Don't look away. We can't remain neutral. He didn't give us that option. He is either the man he claimed to be, that he is actually a king, or he's not. He's either the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, or he's just another man. He is either the hope of the world, or, let's face it, we have no hope at all. Don't look away. Don't, don't go back to normalcy and pretend that we didn't see a sacrifice on the cross. Our Lord's sacrifice on the cross is at the center of history. That cross is everywhere. You can't ignore it. Look at him. 
He is the once and for all atonement of human sin. And listen, Jesus on the cross is the only answer to your deepest question, which is if there's a loving God and he's a just God, how do we account for all this evil? How do we account for a Putin going down and mowing down all these, these Ukrainians? Where's the justice? Jesus on the cross is the justice. When the Son of God takes on flesh as the Lamb of God who committed no sin and gets on a cross in our place amidst all the evil that we do, to atone for our sin and make it possible for us to be forgiven and reconciled back to God, then it's very clear that God has acted once and for all in all of his mercy and in all of his justice, which intersect on the cross, his justice and his mercy. But he did it once. It is definitive. And we have to respond. We can respond with humility, repentance, and faith and be forgiven and be part of the solution or we can mock him, turn away, and, uh, and then we're going to get justice. You're going to get exactly what you want. We're going to get what we deserve. Everyone's going to get what they deserve, you included. And let me tell you how that works. There'll be no quarter. God is absolutely just. And what awaits those who are guilty of sin against God, all the evil that we've done, it's way worse than crucifixion. The Bible calls it hell. It's just getting what we deserve. It's the full penalty of our sin. God will not be mocked. It is a fearful thing to be in the hands of an angry God. We will all be accountable. There's only one hope for any of us, and that is Jesus Christ crucified. Don't look away. Look to the cross every day, all day. Look to the cross. Look to the lamb who was slain. He is our hope. He is the one who's come from us. He, he is the one who came to us, got in the middle with us because he loves us. Church, friends, repent, believe, and be saved. Amen? Will you pray with me? Lord, it hurts to look at you on the cross. It just does. It's upsetting. We don't like to think about it. Many of us think maybe there should have been a better way, a less bloody way, a less painful way, a less torturous way. But when we look at what is happening right now in our world and the horror and the evil of war and the horror and evil of war after war after war, whether it's a war on the battlefield in Ukraine or it's the war in the cubicle next to us, whether it's the war in the way that we talk to our own spouses or our children or our parents, we know that we are capable of tremendous evil and we have all sinned and fallen short of your glory. We are accountable, we are moral creatures, and we know it. And that is a horrible thing and it deserves punishment, even the worst kind of punishment, all of us. And so we see how seriously you take sin when we see Jesus on that cross. And we see how beautiful he is, the one who voluntarily stepped into our place, took our sin and our punishment that we might be forgiven and spared, reconciled to you, reconciled to each other, that we might be those who, being transformed by the Spirit, step out into the world as part of the solution and not a constant contributor to the problem, that we might actually matter for the kingdom of God as agents and ambassadors of your reconciliation, getting into the middle of it with others who are struggling, who are going through hard times, following you with our own cross, living sacrificially, even at the expense of our own time, money, resources, maybe even our own lives, to do what is right. That there might be a resurrection again and again and again, resurrections of marriages, resurrections of parents and families, resurrections of of human beings who are enslaved to addiction. Lord, so many beautiful resurrection stories in your name because your church served as the light of Christ in this hurting culture. We thank you for saving us, for taking our place. Send us now to be agents and ambassadors of reconciliation here and abroad and in all places and all times until we are with you once and for all, we pray this in Jesus' name.
And all the church said, Amen. God bless the church. See you next week. Amen. Before we take communion today, let's take a moment and recite what we believe by saying the Apostles' Creed out loud together. Would you join me, please? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Before we take communion, let's just take a moment and silently prepare our hearts to take communion. Would you join me in prayer silently right now, please? God, we come to the table, to the communion table, with expectant hearts, knowing and remembering what you have done for us. Jesus Christ willingly and obediently gave his life for each one of us on the cross. And then three days later, he resurrected from the dead, paying the price for our sins. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are eternally with you, God. Thank you for the salvation you provide through Christ, God. We're forever grateful for that. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body, this do in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, shed for the remission of sins. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink from this cup, you proclaim Christ's death until he returns. This time you may now take the bread, which represents his body, given for us, and dip it in the cup. And the cup contains his blood shed for the remission of our sins, and take both elements at the same time. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, we thank you for what you've done. You created a way for us to be eternally connected with you. And Jesus had to pay the price for our sins and resurrect from the dead. God, thank you for making it possible for us to be with you forever through a commitment, through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you. And we give you all the glory for this. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today for worship. Hope you have a great week out there serving the Lord in the world. And we look forward to being together again next Sunday. God bless you and have a great week.